company. So I'm going to actually introduce Louis Wharton, who is the president of the Precelerator, and have him say a few words. Uh, you know what, I'm not even going to... Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so welcome to this evening's demo day. I'm going to keep my... Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep my remarks very, uh, fairly brief. I don't really have anything official to say. Um, you know, one of the things that we focus on at Stubbs Alderton is differentiating ourselves by providing practical business advice. And the way that we continue to remain relevant in that area is through the Precelerator, right? So we are constantly interacting with new companies every three months as we assist in growing and scaling those businesses, uh, helping them find traction and helping them find investment. So, again, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to understand what's uh, currently happening in our marketplace and to continue to give back to the ecosystem as Southern California continues to grow, scale, hopefully to one day rival Northern California. Um, so, again, welcome. Thanks for joining. And uh, I look forward to the presentations that we're going to have from Luminous, uh, from Best Food Truck, and from Pay Club. Just really quick, how many uh, alumni companies or current companies do we have in the audience for the Precelerator? Do we have a few back there? Or some here? I know that we're a couple here for the networking portion that had to, to go on. Oh, and a bunch in, oh, a bunch in the simulcast space, so <laughs> giving up their seats for you. So um, very good. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Scott Alderton, who's going to say a few words about the firm. Thank you. Um, I just want to jump back to the mentors for one second. If you're a mentor in our program, will you please stand up, not raise your hand, stand up. So it takes a village to raise a startup. And all of these people, as Heidi said, devote their time and attention. Um, everybody ultimately has, has a financial motivation and they want clients and customers and people like that. But they do everything they do here for an altruistic purpose and that's to help all of these companies and help our ecosystem. And it's really amazing as to what this has become, what this has grown. So thank you very much. Give the mentors a hand. <laughs> And if there were only one and only one thing I could say that's relevant to the success of the Precelerator, it would be Heidi Hubling. So Heidi is amazing. She works countless hours and devotes her, her entire soul and being and eats, sleeps, and drinks this place. And it shows from her efforts. So that's, she's really fantastic, and we're really, really fortunate to have her. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. This is, I think, is our biggest turnout for any event we've ever had here. Um, the, the companies just keep getting better and better. You're going to see some amazing companies tonight um, and, and on into the future. And so I will let you get started with the program. Thank you. All right, so our first company, we'll just dive right in. Our first company is actually uh, with class nine of the companies, and the demo date uh, tonight is with class eight. But uh, they've done really well. They've excelled quickly in the program. They've been uh, joined us in March, beginning of March, and uh, they're currently fundraising and have gone through and have refined their pitch deck. So I gave them the opportunity to pitch tonight as, as our opening pitch. So uh, without further ado, Jason from Pay Club. Okay, we'll just do that. Or you can use it. We're good. Is this gonna work? There we go. All right. Hi guys. My name is Jason, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Pay Club. And we're building the world's first group debit card. For the past 10 years, I've had the opportunity to travel to over 200 universities, both as a fraternity consultant as well as sales director for the largest collegiate travel company in the United States. And you know what? We had a great time. I got to travel to Cabo Spring Break, Vegas Formals, New Orleans Music Festivals. We traveled over 500,000 students and did over 60 million in revenue. Just last month, it was acquired for 25 million. And 
I would work with groups all the time traveling to campuses, and the number one issue that they dealt with was payments. Every single group that you asked, how are you collecting? And they hated the process. You see, it's individual when you're collecting. It's one person collecting from multiple people. No one has a clue what the process is. Everything gets disorganized, tracking everything in multiple Excel sheets, and it's just an arduous process. You know what? We've all dealt with this. Over $330 billion a year is collected by group payments. We're talking group travel, HOAs, roommates, dinners. We've done it. We have all experienced it. And no one wants to be the guy in charge of collecting the money. And that's where we come in. We're building the world's first group debit card. Within PayClub, you can create a group for any reason, each with its own unique digital debit card. You have end-to-end -end transparency, so you can see from beginning to end exactly who's paid and exactly where the money is going. And of course, you can, you can collect and pay instantly. So here's how it works. Everyone can actually see exactly who's paid and what your transactions and how much is, of it has actually come in. And so if you're at that dinner or if you're collecting to purchase something on Amazon or Kayak.com, you can purchase right on the spot. And the way we make money, it's pretty simple. Every single time you swipe your card, we take a percent of the merchant fee so the users never have to pay. And right now, no one's really tackling the group payment space. When it comes to the peer-to-peer -peer payment space, like Venmo and PayPal, it's still one-to-one -one transactions. The club managers, they're extremely expensive, they're web 1.0 systems, and people just don't enjoy the experience. And then the IOU trackers are tracking what you've already spent. But with us, they're tracking and putting things together for what they're about to do. They're putting together the funds for the experiences they're going to take. No one wants to front the kind of money when it comes to group travel. And our target demographic, we're going after Gen Z. Why? Well, they're about to make 40% of our economy. They spend a lot, and they're really increasing their expenditures on experiences. They like to do things, but they also are a little bit different than millennials. They're about private experiences. They're going out with groups of friends, and they're not into publicizing and broadcast media. Rather, they're looking into shared experiences with their close group network of friends. And how are we going after them? Well, my previous experience was all about network effects. I understand groups and I understand college networks. By going after the fraternity network that I've already established previously, it's quite easy. You go onto one campus and that one person can really bring on an entire network onto an app, onto an application, onto a trip. And what's also really cool about these groups, not only do they spend a lot within the fraternities, but they have a higher spending per capita. Every weekend, they're going on road trips. They're doing shared experiences. We have a pretty cool team behind us. We're building the right foundation. You've already heard my experience. Brandon, our CTO, he's pretty incredible. 10 years of full stack development experience working with NASA, American Express, built an entire algorithm on the Lending Club back end that was able to get high returns on the secondary market. We have Alex Grodnick. He just graduated from UCLA's MBA. He was an investment banker, as well as he is the host of the Moving Up podcast, which gets about 20 thousand monthly listens. Uh, then we have Martin Watson. He's our Vice President of Finance. He's had 10 years C-level experience in Fortune 500 companies, specifically dealing with finance and compliance. And of course, we have Nick Roberts. He just came on board. Awesome guy. He was the CMO for Acorns at their launch, which got them to 1 million users. And we just launched seven weeks ago. We have about 500 registered users, and we've done $30,000 in transactions. And we're just at the beginning. We are really testing this with our groups, and what we're looking for now is $600,000 to move us to that next level. We want to build out the debit card features, and we want to start bringing on 100 beta users going into this fall. We have some pretty notable investors behind us. And for us, if you're looking for the next company that and you're just looking for a two to five X multiple, we might not be that right opportunity for you. But if you're looking for the next billion dollar payment company, there's no better choice than to join the club. <laughs>
Sure. Uh, so right now, we are going to be having a closed beta. So we're removing it from the App Store for general use so that people cannot randomly get into it. And this is something we've been working on with Nick over the past few weeks. Uh, rather, we're specifically targeting on specific schools like Cal Poly, for example. We already have three fraternities that are now currently using it for their due system. And what we want to do is go into the fall having a network on specific campuses that we know can have a more viral effect, continue really testing that out. Once we have that, again, my continued network across the U.S., I'm very close with a lot of people and many different campuses. There's over 800 universities in the United States, and I probably have a close network on close to 200 of them. There's a combination. So when it comes to the fraternities, they all have conventions during summer. Uh, we've already been invited to a few and we'll be tabling. Uh, but the key is to find those right people on a campus. And so, like I said, my previous company was just sold. But I'm very close. One of them actually just invested in us. And we're working together to expand Pay Club because they want this being utilized in their system simply because it's just a better way of collecting. Right now, People are, again, collecting through multiple means, and they want a more efficient way to be able to be utilized for them. And so we're working together to go after those really target schools. Do you, do you see this system being used by uh, sports teams? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a target market of what we're going to, and that's because we understand how they spend and what they're going after. But the key is we understand that also that we've all dealt with this issue. We just don't want to go after everyone with a spray and pray model. We're going after a very specific niche market when making it so that we can really dominate there and then move into the next ones. We're talking fantasy football. We've all dealt with that issue. Uh, you know, you're going into Little League Sports. This is a $15 billion industry. There's multiple different levels of where this can go. So do the participants pay in in advance? Like if you're a fraternity group and you're going to Vegas this weekend, do sure. they all put in their $500 in advance so it's in the collective pool? Correct. It can be done in advance, but the, you take on more risk if you want to do it immediate. Similar to currently other peer-to-peer -peer apps can take on a little bit more risk as they... Uh, because there's the way ACH what works. Would stop one individual from grabbing all the money and running? So only one person's in charge of the funds. So what it does is bring clarity and transparency to the entire group, but there's a group owner and they can have admins within the group that can oversee how that money is actually spent, similar to any bank account. And so what's actually different and great about this, so when I worked for the fraternity, uh, we had five groups that were accused of stealing between $5,000 and $25,000. And the reason why was because they were using Venmo. No one had a clue what was happening. Someone's collecting from everyone, and they're not going to go audit this entire system of $150,000. And so it's very easy to top off on that. But with us, you can see the transactions coming out. You can see the money coming in. You can't pull things out differently with people not knowing. But can you stop a transaction before it takes place if it's a bad transaction? Uh, if there's only one person that's in charge, it, it, that's not necessarily something that's built in, similar to a bank account that's not. So everybody uh, in the group has the ability to go put money in, correct. track what's going on, and correct. see all the transactions, but only one person has the debit card and has to make the purchase. Correct. Oh. And whoever he gives the permission to. Thank you. And they can, <coughs> and they can see that that person spent it at the. At Amazon or Kayak or this okay. restaurant. Exactly. Oh, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, you as a customer, you've got Koala at one end, you've got the debit card provider at the other. The customer ownership of FinTech is critical. So right now we're in MVP stage. Uh, and so we want to really prove that the model works, and what we would like to do is get our own licensing. But right now we have to prove that the users want this for us to really move it to that next step. It is a high capital intensity market. To get into FinTech, you can't just have $500,000. Technically, Dwala has the back end, and they carry the information, and that's actually safer for us because when they hold the information, we're not handling the account information. It's all tokenized. So for us, we handle very little bit of information on each user, which is actually very important as we continue to build out the security features and being a startup. It's what we actually prefer. Where you 
kind of nice to have a maybe more flexible system than have a physical card? So it connects right into your Apple Pay. So you'd be able to have it digital debit cards, and it, they're automatically connected to every single group. If you're a club or organization, and you're doing established payments that are constant, that's when you'd want to order an actual physical card. But we estimate, especially with the increase of Generation Z and their love for digital payments, uh, we don't really see that as being too big of a barrier. Uh, the, the Apple Pay card is connected to the main person who owns the group. Correct. We only KYC. There is KYC on every user, but we have more extensive KYC on the person who is collecting. Know your customer. So these are banking terms of like you have to have a little bit more information whenever you sign up for any financial information you put in your name, address, maybe parts of your social. We want to verify who you are and we don't just have some random person spending and taking people's money. We What's also accessory oil or something? No. <laughs> so that's Al Qaeda from being a group. Yeah. <laughs> any other questions? Well, Wonderful. Thank you very much. Come speak to me after. Thank you. So all of these companies will also be available um, afterwards uh, during networking back at their demo tables if you have additional questions. Uh, so next uh, we have uh, Best Food Trucks. Um, and uh, let's see here. Here we go. Um, so I will get you started here. Just one yeah, sure. <coughs> We'll just show a uh, short video, and then I'll start. Sweet. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Best Food Trucks, and our platform allows uh, food trucks to come to your office or event. So we're trying to solve the $30 billion office workers lunch problem, which is you're probably sick of the same three restaurants that you eat over and over. Uh, delivery food is made 30 to 45 minutes before you eat it, uh, so you probably are getting those stale french fries. You can't do last minute orders, for example. And then if you want food trucks, you're in an office park, uh, you have no idea how to book or schedule those food trucks. So that's our solution, is that we have an end-to-end -end solution where you can have order head and lot booking for food trucks. You get fresh food, fresh menus, uh, different cuisine every day, and it's a lot booking, targeted marketing, and daily email menus to make the food trucks' lives uh, easier. Business model is simple, $1.50 convenience fee per order, or a $3.99 foodie plan. If you guys have ever used uh, Postmates Unlimited, it's very similar, so you can use, order as much as you want, you'll get a per uh, order fee. We're moving to a $30 per month uh, fee for the truck to book those spots to use our platform and uh, 40 to $100 per truck per spot in some cities. So for example, at LACMA, those trucks pay uh, $50 per uh, shift to do that. And in some cities where it makes sense, we can actually collect all that revenue. Uh, market from a bottom-up perspective, there's 5.6 million office buildings in the US. If we ever capture only 1% of those buildings, uh, and we have 100 foodie plans per spot at 399 per month, that's 268.1 million ARR of subscription Revenue, very uh, high margin, uh, nice kind of recurring non-transactional. Uh, order head traction, so this, I believe I generated this uh, yesterday from Metabase, so we went from 120 orders per week in the beginning of April 
to uh, 260 orders per week in May. So we've grown about 250% in the last uh, month and a half. Um, and what's cool is like the, the repeat use. I, I'm surprised myself. Uh, we have people that are using us literally, this is the last two weeks by the way, so this is literally every day that people are, are using our products. And uh, when you go down the list, these are even five is about every other day for people that come back and, and uh, use our, our software. Um, in terms of a competitive, uh, competitive moat, um, the order head plus booking is really just a solid uh, kind of defensibility. So for example, uh, Uber Eats has order head, but it doesn't have the booking. And so if Uber Eats gets a little bit more popular, since we control the way in which the food trucks book those spots, we can kind of uh, strongly preference the ones that use our platform. The same thing with the booking side. So if anybody has ever eaten from a food truck at an office building, that comes from a traditional booker where they don't have that order at a platform. So we can come in and say, well, we do what they do, but we actually have a platform where you can order from your phone, get texted when it's ready. It's a lot more convenient. And so it's a nice kind of strong competitive uh, edge that allows us to edge the other traditional bookers out. Uh, strong team. So uh, I had a last company that I took from uh, idea to acquisition. Uh, two years ago to HelloTech, which was represented by Stubbs. Uh, and uh, my co-founder uh, is the head of the National Food Truck Association, helped spin up 19 of the 20 on regional associations, head of the SoCal Mobile Food Vendors, really just one of the most well-known voices in food truck advoc advocacy across the country. And Aaron, who has a PhD in urban planning, great operations background as well. And that's mainly it. So we're attacking a $20 billion office lunch market. It's a huge opportunity. Uh, I have a previous exit. My co-founder has an insane... Uh, competitive advantage, as well as a nice scalable distribution channel, and we're raising our seed round. And that's it. Yes? How much will your seed round be? Uh, we're raising about uh, 500K. So. Uh, can be discussed. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to, uh, I can't say which one, but we just found out two weeks ago we got uh, accepted to one of the most prestigious accelerators. I can't say which one, but I'm happy to follow up uh, pretty soon, so yeah. Explain how the trucks utilize your software to create a menu and get out to the consumer. Uh, yeah, so the trucks um, fill out, uh, like, they either send us a PDF of the menu, we fill it out for them, or they can do it from the menu builder. But it's really important because right now a food truck will show up, like, at your office where People don't see the photos, they have no idea even what the menu is, and so they'll make that decision before they ever even come downstairs and say, oh, we'll just get Chipotle or delivery, whatever. So we, with a menu builder, we allow people to see the photos, they get excited about like Maravilla, like that food truck is just amazing. Uh, and then they just, you know, it's, it's a lot better discoverability for the trucks, and it allows people to get excited about it rather than just eating Chipotle for the 23rd time, so. That's <laughs> fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I. I'm sorry. You, if I go to the drive store here in the Tacoma, where I live, if I want to get a food truck to come to my office, do I use the private truck or the truck will come anyway and you tell me? Yeah. So let's say you have, like, you work at an office and you have 250, 500,000 people, however many people, and you're, you say, I would love to have better lunch options. You go to bestfoodtrucks.com, you say, we want food trucks. We take care of the entire logistics after that. So we have the booking platform where we pick the different trucks, different cuisines, so you don't get two burger trucks, you know, in a row. And we have the ordering platform on top of that, so you can see the schedule and you can order from your phone, get texted when it's ready. So it's kind of like the end-to-end -end process and all the logistics, uh, which right now a lot of people are doing with like Excel spreadsheets and manual PayPal links, and uh, we kind of simplify and streamline all that. So at the end of the day, your office now has a mobile kitchen that parks in front of it with fresh food every day. Uh, I can do that. Sounds good. So uh, cost per acquisition, I would say um, it's kind of, so trucks actually are very easy just because my co-founder is like the head of the National Food Truck Association, the associations will onboard them for us. So there's not a lot of cost, it's, it's basically free on that side. What I would say um, to your point is like a lot. So when we spin up uh, an office building, we wanna provide uh, like kind of free meals off the top. So let's say 
in a lot where you have like a building that's 2,000 people, we might spend $1,000 in free meals or coupons or like, hey, you know, order here to get on the platform. But then after that, if we have the, the booking and the, like I said, the booking fees, the order ahead, uh, either the foodie plans or the convenience fees, we make that back uh, fairly quickly. So it's more on the per lot basis, I would say, is about $500. Um, but that's, we're talking about, you know, hundreds to thousands of people that are involved in that. And the trucks are, are basically free at this point because we have those relationships. Uh, 500, so the nice thing, um, I didn't put up here, but we, we processed 105,000 last month in the booking fees. So like a truck pays the association 50 and we take five from that. So 105,000 gross, 7K net. Um, so our team is relatively small. Our net burn is actually you know pretty low. It's be, you know, between like a five and 10K. Um, so a 500K would, uh, it would last us a year if we just were frugal about it. We'd like to hire uh, two to three salespeople because we have this really proven formula in LA. And we have 150 trucks in LA using it. We have 1,000 trucks booking nationwide, and we want to push that order ahead as soon as possible to, to the rest of the trucks. So uh, it depends on like how many salespeople we order in terms of the, the, the runway for that. So. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> we are, I would say that we are partnering uh, in case, like in LA, for example, there is an ecosystem where we work with partners and we don't want to, you know, we want to make sure there's a, a, a symbiotic relationship there. In a lot of cities where it's very early, there's no organizers, no bookers, where we can uh, go in and, and be that role. But um, I think just for the, the health of kind of our business and the, the partnerships, in LA, for example, it's a bit more of a partnership model. In a lot of cities across the country, it can be, we can own a lot more of the process uh, in, in that vacuum. So, if that makes sense. Yeah, FUDA is, I would say, a direct competitor to, to what we're doing. I, I, uh, yeah, um, so FUDA, for example, uh, they bill themselves as they have a, you know, they're catering to your workplace. But because of kitchen permitting, they can't actually make the food on site. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, where we can actually, you know, when they're making that burger and the fries, that is being prepared, cooked right outside your door, whereas FUDA will make that 45 minutes ago you know, bring it over to you, and so it's not as fresh as what we can do. So um, we have, we're, food trucks are really built for that purpose better than any other kind of apparatus out there, including FUDA. Postmates, we know, is go getting into, like, trying to do mobile kitchens, but it's the same thing. They can't get around the kitchen permitting where they have to make the food, you know, 45 minutes before, where we are the only people that can do that to you. So if you want fresh french fries, we're literally the only option out there. Yeah. Um, How do you train them to be able to use it effectively? I, a very short story. The first time we onboarded a truck was about like when we were beta, it was six months ago, and it was like this. We had to do a lot of process. It took us a couple days to kind of get through. We have it down to we can meet a truck at 1030 that's never heard of us, and they'll be live with a menu with photos. They know how to use it by 1055, ready for a shift by 11. So we got incredibly good at the process of going from literally never hearing about us to within 25 minutes uh, before their shift, getting everything up and running, and then they do a, you know, a shift, they do 10, 15 orders the first time, and then, yeah, so I mean, I think we just got, uh, did a, a ton of iterating, a lot of, uh, n you know, not bad experiences, but like kind of learning from one when it didn't work out, but now at the point we just have this down uh, to a science, so. Uh, there's no like high end or, for example, our, our goal is that whether you're a gourmet food truck, whether you just have like a cart, as long as it's licensed. Um, but I think, uh, for example, there's the, the trucks that go through like the individual stops, kind of like the, um, the, the taco trucks where we can absolutely tie into them because, um, they're constantly moving and they want better access to the customers and like, Hey, you know, we're actually out here and get that visibility. So I think really, if you're not a brick and mortar restaurant, we can help you find the customers that you need. Uh, you have to get, actually we know the organizer that does LACMA, you have to book through our system to be able to get access to that. And for example, LACMA, those eight trucks, that's one of our, our sites. Uh, we have that booked pretty much through the next uh, month or two, but you, you can get on our system, 
get access to that. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, so we have the platform, for example, Lockma specifically has an organizer, which we're the software platform that kind of does that. So like I was saying before, like an or that's a case where there's an organizer that does Lockma, and we're the software platform that, that kind of empowers that, and we take a marketplace fee off that. In some cities, we'll be able to do the end-to-end -end process. We are the organizer. But specifically to your point, like anybody who wants to park at Lockma, they have to contact the organizer there, and we're the, the software platform that powers that, so they'd be booking through our site. Cool, thank you very much. So up next we have uh, Jeremy with Luminous. And uh, let's see here. Thank you all for all joining us tonight. Um, and before I kick off, I do just wanna reiterate what Scott said. And without Heidi Hubbling, uh, none of this would be possible. It is fantastic to be part of this program um, and have her here every day. So thank you. <laughs> and of course, thank you to Stubbs, Aldish, and Markleys as our hosts. Um, but my name is Jeremy Wall. And today I'm going to tell you about how we're making consumer electronics that are designed to save lives. But before I tell you what we're doing, I'm going to tell you why. Five years ago, I came within three centimeters of almost being killed by a car. I was riding my bike to class while I was studying product development, and this could have been a life-altering experience for me, but I was lucky. Comparatively, 800 people a year in the U.S. alone are killed by motor vehicles simply while riding their bikes. That equates to about every eight hours someone is killed, and this is just in the U.S. alone. But those are deaths. Countless more injuries happen on an almost hourly basis, and that's, again, just in the US on bicycles. The current solutions are bike lights, which are traditionally dumb. They don't communicate any information, so we still have to do hand signals, which most drivers don't understand, and taking your hands off the handlebars is quite dangerous. With the proliferation of the smart light bulbs inside homes, it's time for those to go mobile. And reflective clothing kind of just makes you look like a walking traffic cone. So, we came up with Luminous. Luminous uses the Internet of Things and connects software to our hardware to create life-saving smart lighting. For a quick example of what that is, our software is what we call zero UI, zero user interface. That means that it doesn't require you to tap a bunch of buttons or engage with it. It happens automatically. And this gives us agile scalability. We're not just a hardware widget. We have the ability to add new platforms, new features, almost on a daily basis. And with that modular architecture, we're starting in biking, but there's so much more. Our first system included brake lights that automatically sense deceleration and flash as you slow down. We can tell when you're going through a dangerous intersection where one third of accidents occur and automatically strobe in that danger zone. We know when you're going left if you put in a final destination and predictably give you a left turn signal before you get there. And if you're a trainer, you can actually say, I want to ride an eight minute mile. The lights will change color in real time, keeping you on your target pace. And with this first product, with our backpacks and accessories, we got fantastic reviews. We were in plenty of competitions. We had actually placement in men's journal, consumer bike essentials. But this was just the beginning. As we prepare for Luminous 2.0, we've made a new product a smart LED strip that is a first of its kind wearable smart light. It allows you to put it on whatever your use case is, whether it's your arm, your helmet, or your bike itself. And this new product is all self-contained, has the battery and the Bluetooth in one unit. So you don't have to require any other pieces. You can use this however you want, and it's very agile. The new product includes magnet attachments in the middle, so you can actually pop it on and off super easy. Self-contained battery and PCB there in one side, but also these GoPro type attachments that allow you to pop it on and off, so you can have multiple lights on one system and they all mesh together in a single place. Our go-to-market strategy. We're starting by launching direct to consumer. Right down the street is Agency 2.0, one of the best crowdfunding agencies in the entire world. We're working with them to launch a crowdfunding campaign this fall. We'll then go direct to consumer through Amazon where we have a great margin. 
But beyond that, we have already got three committed partners for wholesale orders. Moose Jaw, which is the outdoor arm of Walmart.com, has committed to putting 1,000 units for this holiday season before they've even seen samples. Beyond that, Timbuktu is a strategic partner, and Heidi, you can actually pass that bag around. Our first prototypes with them, which you can see over there, or if you want to inspect later, are coming around the room. We're working with them to integrate a Luminous compatible backpack so that you can buy a system that is perfectly built for Luminous. They're ordering 1,000 units as well to ship with these products. That's for bicyclists, but then OGO, one of the major motor motorcycle manufacturing brands that makes your traditional hard shell backpacks. They already save lives with hard shell backpacks, so adding to that technology is a no-brainer for them. This is actually our placement in the Timbuktu catalog. Our price point is $69 per strip. We have bundle options, which allow you to save if you buy a few. And then for our wholesalers, we certainly have a different margin program there. But our landed cost is $14. So direct to consumer, we're closer to a 70 point margin, but blended across wholesale and retail, we're making a 63% margin on this hardware. But what I like to talk about is the fact that hardware is the Trojan horse for Luminous software. What that means is that we create a recurring revenue stream beyond selling that initial widget. And with this recurring revenue stream, if we charge $5 a month for our premium software features, we include the safety features as standard, turn signals, brake lights. We were created to be safer. But we have premium features that certainly add on to that. And that allows us to have a 500% recurring revenue stream that adds lifetime value beyond the average hardware product. Luminous 2.0 is built to be much more than just for biking. We've already got all of the partners that you see there on the left. Consumer, consumer products with the backpack with Timbuktu, Bole with a smart helmet, but where we see the future of this is industrial safety. Everywhere that you see a reflective vest out on the highway should be augmented with technology especially smart technology that is actually telling you about that user and letting that user learn about their environment. We went through a Department of Homeland Security incubator called Emerge, which took consumer-oriented technologies and specifically repurposed them for first responder safety. We're also working with teams in fashion and we'll hopefully have four pieces on New York Fashion Week this September through Wearable Media Studio and we're just locking in a great partnership with a local company in the entertainment space to put these on concert goers or in live events such as football or basketball games. We add intelligence that these other companies don't have by having software and hardware on a single platform. We've got a great team. It comes from the confluence of outdoors and consumer electronics with the Internet of Things. Anthony and, uh, or Adam and AJ couldn't join us tonight, but we also have strategic partners. Jacob owns a group in, in Shenzhen and Shanghai that does consumer ma manufacturing. We've already gotten an investment of them of $65,000 to kick off our non-recurring engineering and tooling. This gets us everything up to mass production. But we have a team that's our project managers and beyond local investors who have gotten us to this point. But we're raising $250,000 to do mass production to launch this via crowdfunding this holiday season. We'll be launching the crowdfunding campaign in September, but with our target timelines, we will have the Luminous product under trees and in houses this December. <laughs> so keep an eye out for us on Kickstarter. If you'd like to learn any more, I'm happy to talk more, but it comes back to why we started this. No one should be dying because they're just simply riding a bike. That was the impetus for this discovery, and it has grown far beyond that. If you want to be part of this journey, please come talk to me after, and we can talk about how you can help be brighter. Thank you. Yes, so Moose Jaw and Timbuktu, we actually have physical orders from. Uh, Moose Jaw is 500 units first, com first commitment, same size with Timbuktu, 500 committed, but they're looking at doing 1,000 for price breaks reasons. Um, part of this is that we have not shipped samples of our actual tooled pieces. They've seen the prototypes and have committed at that. So these are modifiable purchase orders that we have, but we do have purchase orders in hand from both those groups. So that's not yet bankable? Not bankable, no.
inflation sounds low. It seems like you're really on a trajectory here, and you might need more capital than that. So really, we see this as a bit of a bridge round. Um, it allows us to launch the product and have cash flows coming in. Uh, part of that is that we do have a few different opportunities with this technology, and we're going after bicycling first. So this 250 is kind of a litmus test of figuring out do we see bicycling? Do we see industrial opportunities, larger or smaller? And so once we've been able to prove that out, have some cash flows from just revenue sales of this product through 2019, we would be looking. So I mean, that 250 gets us about 12 months. And then with cash flows, we can continue to grow. But we would be raising again in des about December of next year. Yeah, and so we're making our product in Shenzhen. Um, so, I mean, that's part of it. There's kind of, yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but there's three moats against competition. One is we actually have patents filed around the utility of how these lights flash. Geolocation-based turn signals, navigation, the brake lights, that's really where our patents fall in the U.S. and internationally. Um, but one of the things that gives us a little bit more of that moat to competition is that we're doing hardware and software. And so by splitting those two up, it's a little bit harder to just copy that widget. They can't reverse engineer this and automatically learn about our firmware and the connection to the software. So I mean, we do have some of those defensible elements just because we're breaking the product up from being a single widget. Um, one of the things that we really do see ourselves excelling in is these partnerships. And that's what gives us the brand equity as opposed to necessarily just being the cheapest product. I mean, with LED lights, it has certainly been a race to the bottom. Unless you're doing high-end, high, uh, like growing lights or mass-saving battery lights for an entire warehouse, like LEDs is a commodity. Um, but that's really where we see the intelligence of the software, the modularity of that platform, being how we can protect ourselves by continuing to be smarter than any of the other solutions you can just buy from DHgate or Alibaba. Is there a fourth seat? Yeah, there's a stool down. First time we got here, went on a restroom break. Oh, no. There was nobody. I was trying to wrong time. I'm so sorry. Well, I'm glad you had it. You're seven, and we're starting a little early. So. Yeah, I kind of did. Oh, hey, how are you guys? Hi, Doug. How are you today? It's been about 20 years. All right. Let's get started back up. Um, I don't know if people are in the overflow room, but there are a dozen seats in here if anybody wants to come in and grab a seat. Uh, all right, all right, all right, let's go. We have a great, great panel. This is, uh, we are really fortunate to have um, some really fantastic firms and people here uh, for this event. I am going to start by just telling you who's here, and then I'm going to let you each take a, just a minute and tell us a little bit about your fund and, and uh, where you're from. So. Rene LeBran is from um, Rustic Canyon Fontis, and you're going to have to explain to me how Rustic Canyon morphed into Fontis because I don't know that story. I, I knew all the old Rustic Canyon folks. Uh, 
<laughs> but Renee is, is, a, is a more than 25 year uh, veteran VC and we're very, very fortunate to have her. Um, next to her is Rob Vickery, who is a founder of Stage Venture Partners, and they're a seed stage um, uh, B2B fund. You'll tell us about your fund. Um, next to him is Riley Kovach, who is an investor uh, working with March Capital Partners. And for those of you that don't know March Capital Partners, they are, they, if they're not already, they're becoming a fixture in the LA landscape. It is a rock star fund started by um, uh, uh, Jim Armstrong and Jamie Montgomery, among others, who are who are literally VC legends in our community. So we're very fortunate uh, to have Riley. Thank you for coming. And at the very end of the aisle, but not least, is Joe Miller. Uh, Joe Miller works with Morpheus Ventures, which is uh, a recent fund uh, raised here in Los Angeles. Joe is a longtime um, merchant and and uh, investment banker from the Houlihan Loki days, way back when. He works with a company called Europlay Capital Partners, which is a close partner of ours. Uh, he was instrumental in the scaling and growth of Skype and was on their audit committee uh, and works with the founders of Skype um, in making and helping uh, focus their investments. So why don't we just go down the line really quickly and you can just say a word or two about your fund, Renee. Sure. So um, I guess I don't really actually have a fund right now. So. <laughs> Uh, Renee LeBron, I was actually a founding partner of Rustic Canyon Ventures, uh, which was one of the uh, kind of original large funds here in, in LA. We started it in 2000. We spun out of uh, Times Mirror. Um, around kind of late, mid, late 90s, we also formed another fund called RC Fontis, which was a later stage consumer fund. Um, those funds are all kind of in, in wind down now, um, and I've spent the last few years doing a couple of things. One, um, I'm an advisor and board member at Idea Lab, which was um, kind of the earliest. I've had a lot of early first. Uh, I think I'm feeling really old here. Uh, uh, incubators uh, in Pasadena. It's now the longest standing, I think. Um, and uh, I now, uh, so I do board work and serve um, on a variety of boards and advise a number of startups. And I also spend a lot of time, uh, Lisa and Heidi here, on uh, an organization called Women Founders Network for women entrepreneurs. Um, we're kind of a virtual uh, accelerator and we do a competition uh, every year. Um, we're accepting applications now if you're a female founder. And um, I guess, uh, lastly, I'm an angel investor and uh, um, also help bring more uh, angel investors into the community. So, and I primarily invest in uh, women, found, women founded companies, um, largely because now I don't have a fund, I can invest in whatever I want. That's awesome. Wish I could invest in whatever I want. Um, so I'm Rob, I'm, uh, I'm the co-founder and general partner of uh, Stage Venture Partners. We are a SaaS enterprise software fund only. Um, we focus on the seed stage. Most of our founders have got a little bit of revenue, a couple of customers, some key employees, a little bit of growth. Um, my background before all this was that in the UK I was a fintech entrepreneur and I built uh, a new distribution channel for banking in the UK that generated about $130 million in revenue. Sadly, I was 26 and I saw none of that, um, but it was cool. Uh, and I got sent over here and I became an angel investor and had a really good run at doing that. And then finally, my co-founder and I met through a nonprofit that we were on the board of that was helping at-risk youth go to the best schools in the country. So we came together, raised our first fund. We invested in three companies. One of those got sold to Snapchat four, um, actually, sorry, six months ago now. Um, and then we closed our second fund on June 28th of this year, which is awesome. It's just like you guys, we're raising capital all the time, and it sucks. Um, and uh, that's a $20 million fund. We've done 12 investments from that. We've just, as of... As of six o'clock tonight, we're just leading our 13th deal, um, which is really cool. Um, we focus, not entirely, but by accident, we've found that our best performing deals are founders who have come from uh, diverse backgrounds. So um, a, a third of our portfolio is run by women, a third's run by veterans. Uh, we've got uh, entrepreneurs with disabilities, we've got immigrants, we've got people like me, I'm an immigrant. Um, and we just found that seems to correlate better with our portfolio, so we're really proud of that. Um, that's it. Great, thanks. I'm Riley Kovach. I work at March Capital Partners. We're just down the street. Uh, I, I birded here, if you guys were interested in knowing that. <laughs> like I bird everywhere. Yeah, nice. 
we have uh, fund one was $240 million. We've deployed that across 30, 30 portfolio companies. We're just closing fund two. That should land about $300 million. We're relatively stage agnostic, uh, A to C as the core, that we like to do some later deals as well. We typically don't do any seed deals. We do all B2B software investing. Um, yeah, we're closing up on fund two and uh, really looking forward to it. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Joe Miller, managing partner at Morpheus Ventures. We're currently investing out of a $80 million fund. As of, uh, I think, sometime this afternoon, we have now have 10 investments in the fund. Um, echoing your sort of seem to be always capital raising, so we feel your pain. Um, and uh, we invest uh, primarily, almost exclusively, in disruptive tech. So it's pretty broad, whatever that means. Uh, we'll tell you. We know it when we see it. It's, uh, it's like that. Anyway, okay. Thanks, Scott. Hang, hang on to the mic, and I'll okay. start with you on this next question. So everybody wants to meet you guys. And um, we've all sort of heard about the value of a warm introduction, that uh, you don't just go online and look at your website and send an email and then wait by your computer for you guys to, to reach back out. So um, describe what is the best way to approach your fund. And uh, if you have any good war stories about the wrong way to do it, let's share those too. Um, you know, I think just sending me something by LinkedIn and hoping that it's going to resonate is a pretty low likelihood if we don't know you. If, if we know you, we know somebody in common. There's a better likelihood. If it's, but, but we don't rule it out. So if you have something that's amazing and you can articulate it in one paragraph, sure. I've got a call tomorrow set up from somebody who... Um, to answer your follow-up question, how many times before they became annoying? I think the answer was two. I looked at it. I looked at it a second time. I said, "All right, you 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 got a phone call." So um, I don't I don't have any particular horror stories. We haven't had anybody camping out in our lobby. Um, nobody uh, nobody threatening us. Your lobby is my lobby, so I would have thrown them out. <laughs> right. So we haven't had anybody threaten us. If they don't get a meeting, they're going to uh, do anything like that. So sorry sorry to disappoint. Riley? Yeah, I think something to keep in mind is that each investment group has a particular focus. We get a lot of stuff that's just outside our wheelhouse. Maybe that has to do with you know, our focus being sort of broad at some points, or maybe we don't communicate it that well. But if people come to us and say, hey, you want to do this consumer seed deal? I'm like, well, we don't do either of those, so sorry. Um, one funny story, we had these guys come around the building and they came and knocked on the door and dropped off their pitch in a little uh, USB stick, which I, th I thought uh, took some guts. We looked at it, it wasn't the right fit, but um, uh, generally I'd say that's, that's probably not the best way. That's code for it sucked. Yeah, yeah, not the best way. I, you know, it's all about providing value, right? So if you can know what a partner, what someone on the investment team is really interested in, provide them with an introduction or an insight or an article, I think that's a, the best way to get their attention. I um, completely concur with LinkedIn email. I detest LinkedIn email. I, you know, it just doesn't work. Um, the ways that do work that I really like are, think about like the life flow of our business, which is LPs, which most of you Maybe you can help with, maybe you can't. But deal flow. So where do we get deal flow from? So we get deal flow from our service providers. We get them from friends that we know, you know, places that we trust. So lawyers, accountants, um, people like that. So maybe find out who else is well connected in this industry and ask them for an introduction. That, that's a great way to, to get to know us. Uh, we do have a website form that, believe it or not, I do read. Um, do that. Um, also, go on Twitter and learn about what we like. My co-founder and I are pretty vocal on Twitter. Uh, oops. Uh, he hates Donald Trump, for example, so don't send us anything about Republican tech. Uh, but no, um, but like, you know, you, you'll see that I really like, shit on VR all the time because I, I've seen VR so much and I wanted it to work and it just doesn't work. So I spent a long time talking about how I don't want to invest in that. So maybe follow us and read what we talk about and what we like. Um, that's quite a compelling way to do it. The best pitch, not the worst, the best way I've had somebody introduced to us was actually um, they work out that I love playing video games. Um, and one of them presented us their pitch in Unity. And he actually presented it using a PlayStation 4 controller. And I was just like, dude, you rock. <laughs> Didn't fund it, but it was still a really great, <laughs> great pitch. Um, so be creative, you know, and just don't, you know, just don't come sit in the office. It's never going to work. 
guess the only thing I would add uh, is, you know, why do we care about an introduction? And, you know, in my years in, in venture, my inbox, you know, would just be flooded with uh, people sending me pitches. It's still, I mean, people that, you know, st are still sending me things for Rustic Canyon. I mean, it's, it's really crazy. And so the only way that I can possibly sift through it is to have somebody at least do a pre-screen for me and at least say, like, this person's credible and they might have something here and I think it would be a fit for you. So that's why I think that connection and that introduction from someone that I know is generally so important. I, I've got my own. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, well, Rob, maybe I'll start with you on this one. H how often do potential to prospective companies that are look seeking investment for you they give you their deck. How often do they ask you to sign an NDA and explain why you'll never do that? Oh, for fuck's sake. All right. Um, uh, this is a really great article. So we get that probably, we saw 1,400 deals last year. We invested in nine. Probably about 10% of those asked me to sign an NDA. There's a great guy in my, our industry that I respect the most, a guy called Brad Feld. If you don't know who he is, find him, follow him, buy all of his books. He writes a perfect article about why, it's called Why VCs Don't Sign NDAs. And there's, you know, there's two reasons for that. One is, if you're building a um, IoT device for people you know, trying to prevent from being injured on their bicycle, and I have to sign an NDA for that, I can never see another deal that is doing anywhere in the same space as that ever again. Otherwise, you have every right to sue me. It's not going to happen. Um, yeah. Secondly, you know, it's in, our interest, it's in our interests to not share your best secrets. It would kill us. You know, if someone got out that I'd done that, I'd never see a deal ever again, and it would just ruin my business. So we don't do that. Don't ever ask us to do it because we'll never sign it. And to be honest, you kind of like scupper your chance of actually even getting a pitch because by that time we're like, this guy's a rookie. So we don't, well, this person's a rookie. So um, yeah, just don't do it. Yeah. Anybody want to add anything to that? Yeah, don't ask. It's the answer is no, and if you don't know that, then you're pretty much not going to get funded. The Brad Feld article, 2008. Go and find it and just save it. Uh, okay. Um, let's let's spend a little time talking about the pitch deck. So we've all everybody here who's in the company has probably built a pitch deck. They all sort of look like, you know, this is my problem, this is my solution, this is the size of the opportunity, this is my execution go-to-market strategy, this is my team, this is the competition out there, these are my competitive advantages, these are my barriers to entry, um, this is my ask and what I'm going to do with your, per with your proceeds, and maybe I've got some financial projections in there. Fair? Sure. Okay, that's what a deck looks like. So how long of a deck do you want to see, Joe? You want to see something... 50 pages, nine pages, what do you, you want to see a business plan, you want to see a PowerPoint, what do you want to see? Um, so normally uh, when I'm even advising portfolio companies or, or looking, it's the same advice, which is you have a very short amount of time to actually get somebody on the hook. And so you have to do that in the first two or three slides. I'm not, I don't know which, what they're going to be. It depends on the story, but you've got, you, you got to do it in two or three slides and you got another two or three slides to set the hook. That's it. If you don't, it's now a boring presentation. You haven't, you're not going to win. It doesn't matter how much time you have. So I don't, I'm, I'm not a fan of the formulaic, um, maybe because we just see so many of, you know, like mission statement and here's where to, it's just, um, don't be boring um, when you're when you're pitching because I don't. Th have you guys ever funded a boring entrepreneur? Not so much. Maybe. I mean, you know, a, a, a brilliant scientist. You know, okay, but you know, it, it's just like people want to fund people that they um, that they like, visions they like. Um, they're different. Uh, different approaches, so I think one of the things you're trying to really get out across is the personality of the entrepreneur. Is this person somebody who can build a team, can attract investment, and can get a product to market? And it's not a formula for, for us anyway. Yeah, I think those sections that you listed are good to have because when we think critically about a company, those are the bases we're going to want to cover. Like Joe said, you don't have that much time. If you get invited in, you'll have an hour. 
um, which is a little bit more time. But if you're sending a deck, you have to be able to understand what they do within a few seconds. Like the first slide, whatever, the first three slides. Sometimes you go through a whole pitch and you go through this whole arc of this, you know, these sections, and then it's like, bam, at the end. That's how a movie works. Uh, you don't have that much time. But we got to know right up front because you don't want to sit through 20 minutes of slides or like go through the whole thing and be like, okay, well, what, what does this company do still? So I think having a summary right at the beginning is, is crucial. I think there's like two clusters of questions that we look to answer. Um, the first one I talk about a lot, which I'm not going to do a lot tonight, but is like the why you, why now, why us? Why are you the right person? Why is the now right time for your company? And why are we the best investor for you? That's cluster number one. Um, cluster number two, which is very important to us for SaaS enterprise software, is um, another three questions is, can you hire someone? I can tell you right now, hiring is the hardest thing ever you'll ever have to do for your startup. Can you hire? Can you ship a product? Do you know how to build a product? Do you know how to get it ready for market? Do you know how to distribute it? And then secondly is, um, can you sell? Yeah, selling software. Software is a product that is never like, you know, like bought. You don't wake up and say, do you know what, I really need, no, no, I, I, I really need a new payment software. You, it's sold to you. You, you, you. you pushed it, right? So you need to be able to sell. You need to hire, sell, and ship. That's what I need to see in your pitch deck. And also financial projections. Anything beyond 12 months, they are a work of fiction. So why spend you know, telling me 2025 what that's going to look like? It's just BS. So just focus on like, the use of proceeds. If it's 12 to 18 months of runway, how are you going to spend it? What milestones is it going to accomplish? And how confident are you that you're going to be able to raise a Series A that's going to give me a markup off the back of that? Yes, I would just add a couple of mistakes that I see uh, very commonly. The first is that people tend to go into too much detail. So when I see a deck and it's got lots of stuff in it and you start to say, like, why don't you take that out? Oh, but it's so important. Just remember that, well, first of all, think about what you're trying to do with your pitch. Are you just trying to get a meeting or is this your first meeting? But generally, either you're trying to get a meeting, in which case you only need a very concise amount of information that's just going to get somebody interested and that they have to be able to understand on their own. The second thing is if you do get in the door, this is not your, I mean, this is your only chance to make a good impression, but if you do, it's not the only chance you're going to get to explain the business. So be really, really clear about what the most important things that someone needs to know about you that will make them want to talk to you more. Not just invest in your business, but talk to you more. So all those extra slides that you just are so attached to, honestly, if you're any good, you'll get another shot to do that. The second thing, and I think maybe to reiterate Riley's point, you know, I, th I think I'm a reasonably smart person and I've sat through a lot of these, but sometimes I sit through a presentation and I still can't figure out what they're doing. <laughs> and it's a very uncomfortable situation, you know, and there's a kind of like these very lofty statements about how they're going to change the world and revolutionize this industry and, you know, fundamentally develop whatever, blah, blah, blah. And honestly, I just have no idea what they're talking about. So um, that, and, and it happens a lot. Uh, and I think people just try too hard to make their business sound, their ideas sound big. Like, just tell me what it is. And I guess, you know, the, the third thing um, is to be really clear about your advantages. And I think people sometimes, um, you know, forget that they spend so much time trying to explain to you why the, idea, why the idea is good and they can't necessarily tell you why you're special or why you're going to succeed. So just, I think those all pretty much boil down to being really succinct and being very clear about the few pieces of information that you have to get across in that meeting, whether it's half an hour or an hour or five minutes. Be really mindful of how much time you have and what you want the person to take away. Yeah, those are those are really good points. I mean, it's how the human brain works, right? When you if you if if you start going into nuances in your presentation, and I don't really yet have an idea of exactly what it is you're doing. I'm not listening to a thing you're saying. It just is like the Charlie Brown thing. It's wah 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 because I'm trying to figure out what it is that you do. It's like the first thing you have to do is say, "This is what we do." You know, we make lights to put on people so when they ride their bikes, they don't get killed. Okay, I get it. Now let's talk about your business. All right, it's like that's really important. And those ex all those extra slides. Put them in an annex that you don't deliver with the first pitch to get the meeting so that when you get the meeting and the questions come up, you can go, that's annex four. Here it is. Here's the answer. But don't send them a 37-slide deck because no one's going to understand it or anything like that. 
Rob, let's go back to your point on the financial model, because I wholeheartedly agree that, that even the 12-month financial model is not, is not accurate or relevant. There's only one thing we know about a financial model, and that's that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I still think they're important, okay? So I'd love, I'd love your guys' perspective. The reason why I think they're important is because they demonstrate to you from the entrepreneur's perspective how they think the financial part of their business is going to work. And we know it won't work that way, but it lets you look at them and go, is that rational? Is that not rational? And if it's really super rational, maybe it won't work that way, but at least they're thinking about the model the right way. And now I think they're smart people and I want to talk to these people versus the people who say, you know, here's the market and it's, it's only a $300 million market, but all we have to do is capture half of it. And it's like, eh. Conversation over. But, and like, so yeah. Money yeah. Or, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, what do you guys think about the financial model? I think, yeah, the model is a great way of assessing how people think. You're absolutely right. Um, I think what it can do, what I like to see, and something that I learned when I was an entrepreneur was like building three financial models. And I like that, actually. I like to, when we start doing digging in on, a, uh, on an entrepreneur, I ask them for a base case, which is, all right, everything is on track. This is what it looks like. This is how much we need to spend. This is where this might go. And what happens if 25% of your, what you're planning on is late or revenue is 25% lower? I like to see a financial model that is a negative model. And then I like to see one which is just like, we just, just like kick the ass out of this thing and we're 25% above target. So I like to see three different models that break apart three different scenarios. Um, and then ultimately, everything's got to come back to use of proceeds, right? So if you're raising 500 grand, how are you going to spend it? And how much more, how much is that going to get you closer to the milestones that you need? So just make it logical. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think at an early stage, it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, if you don't have a business yet and you're making a model, I think what Scott said is true. It's like the only thing that's true about that model is it's 100% wrong. Uh, we work at some later stage companies, so obviously it's important. They do have a track record. That's where it starts to matter. I think um, from an entrepreneur's perspective, it's good to know, it's good to have a plan for your business, right? So even if you're not going to show a model in the room or to any investors, you need to think critically about, okay, how much is this person actually going to cost when I hire them? How long is it going to take to ramp this sales guy up? How big are my deals going to be? And how many of them do I really think I can get? Um, because, you know, going, betting your whole life on just faith and a good idea, uh, you know, it's tough, right? We all know that. So it's good to have a plan. For me, I would just, you know, have that internally, and then as far as showing it, maybe you don't need to. <clears throat> yeah, Scott, so I, I look at models uh, very differently depending on stage. So we, we do seed A and B. Um, seed is a means to an A. Seed comes in. I'm not, I'm of course paying attention to the spending model. We always pay attention to the spending side of it and, and runway side. But, you know, the, the models are just so wrong that, you know, to sort of uh, bring the false precision of modeling it back and using, using some discounted cash flow to derive a valuation and then have a, or have a scientific discussion about what a fair valuation is because the DCF says X. That's preposterous. Um, so, you know, at, at a later stage, if it's a B stage, um, obviously we, we care a lot more about that because that's a factor in, the, in how much burn is going to be there. So you have to really look at the revenue. Um, we're a little, we're more focused, everyone's different. We're very focused on, on margin, which is, um, do, do we have a business that uh, that can achieve a positive gross margin? You'd be surprised how many businesses um, end up not being able to achieve a positive gross margin, and you cannot make that up in in volume. Um, so, you know, I, I think uh, depend. It's really stage dependent. Yeah. Sorry, I just. Sorry, I want to just add, add a few things. Um, I, I agree with everything that was said, but I. I do think even in an early stage pitch, there's some things that I'm looking for in what you show. I'm not looking for a really detailed model, but I do want to know, first of all, sometimes I look at a plan and it's either so ridiculously out of line how big someone thinks something's going to be in three years that I just realize they don't have any idea what the world is like. Um, or secondly, you know, they're going to spend f five years and they're going to be $12 million. 
okay, that's nice for you, but it's not really great for a venture investment. So the first thing is really how are you thinking about this business and is this really a business that makes sense for me to fund? Um, also, how much cash is it going to take? But then what are just some key assumptions in there, whether it's you know, showing that um, your gross margins maybe make sense. So if someone is starting something to say, really, you think you can produce that right out the bat at that kind of margin? I mean, there's a lot of reality tests in there that even on a very simple back of the envelope margin, I think you can look for reasonableness. And I would not underestimate the importance and value of that. Okay, well, let's let's uh, shift to a, a like a super early stage question. So. Um, Riley, you'll be at a disadvantage here, but the rest of you, I'd love your perspective. So most of the companies, at least that are in the pre-accelerator or these early stage companies that we, that we deal with, they are, um, you know, they're a founder group, they're an incomplete package, they're super early stage, they're very resource constrained. Um, the business plan is telling a story about the whole business, but they're not a whole business. So how would you like to see them dealing with the the holes in their business plan and the pieces that aren't there. Team, maybe go to market strategy if they're really early and they don't really understand exactly how they're going to go to market, the kind of pivots they need to make, the things that are necessarily missing from their business plan because they just don't have the resources yet to get there. What do you want to hear about those things? Well, I would first want to see some recognition that you know what you're missing. Um, sometimes people don't know what they're missing. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so I think the first thing just you know be honest about it because it's better for you just to come clean than for me to have to you know embarrass you and say like well did you think about right so um so come clean and then tell us how you intend to get there and we understand if if we are really you know very you know angel investors uh you know we we understand where people are but we also know what it takes to get there so if you say i really need to find you know, someone who understands, uh, you know, whatever, I need to find someone who understands this particular technology, well, maybe show me why you think you can actually find that person or why you can attract them. I mean, Rob mentioned hiring. You know, why can you bring that person to the table or whatever it is that you're missing? Because that really is what we're betting on. We're betting that you can execute this very unformed plan, that you can attract the right people, that you know how to find and pick the right people, um, or find the right people to manufacture, whatever it is that's really missing in your plan. Yeah. I think um, one of the things I see a lot with pre-seed, we're not a pre-seed investor, but see quite a few pre-seed decks. A lot of you, a lot of entrepreneurs kind of rush to the outsourced developers to build their product. And you know, that can work, and, but most of the time it doesn't because you're building platform risk within your business. You don't own the technology that they're building, and if something goes wrong or you want to make another change, you have to pay them another 10 grand or another 100 grand or another 200 grand. So I like, like startups that kind of have that, that approach to filling in the blanks and hiring a great CTO who's going to do that for you and being honest about it. Um, so, yeah, kind of go back to people not using outsourced devs. I think um, also kind of embracing the fact that you're – Everyone talks about a like, total addressable market, right? It's a $20 billion business. It's huge. It's massive. I like people that, when they're really early on, are trying to break down into that market to find a smaller TAM, something which is much more focused, that is achievable, that can be tackled, right? So just keep it real um, and don't fill in the blanks with, um, with people that create platform risk. Yeah, at that stage, it's, I mean, it's all about the team. It's really investing in that person. I did an angel investment with a guy who I trusted, and the product ended up being something different. And I was like, oh, you know, what are you doing, man? But I trust him, and the company is going well. Um, so I think if you can have some sort of some some buzz around what you're doing and show an ability to bring in people to fill in those holes, that's a good a good sign. Yeah. So w one of the things that we look for, especially really at, at, at any stage is does the entrepreneur really understand their market um, are they deep in it or are they taking this view of you know yeah can cancer's a big market well no no shit right um, you know but how are you actually do you understand the dynamics of the market you are trying to penetrate who has who owns the customer how do you uh, get to the customer those kinds of things are really important early 
really, bef I mean, before you do your first pitch. Um, because if, if we get a feeling that you're just sort of going out there because it's a big market, but you haven't taken three layers of the onions deeper so that you actually know where you're going first, why you're going first, how you're going first, then you, you don't give us the confidence that you're necessarily going to get there. Um, so it's, sure, market size matters, but market dynamics matter a lot. Okay. Um, bi business plan as opposed to a pitch deck. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs are advised to put together a full-blown business plan, the, the, the big, thick thing with everything in it. Um, as an exercise or even as a backup plan, sometimes you probably get them sent to you along with the pitch deck. Good idea, bad idea, relevant, not relevant? Depends on stage. In what sense? You know, late stage company looking for growth capital, you better have your act together. Um, you know, if you're, forget what your, what your number is, but if you're in market and you've got products and if it's complex and you're actually manufacturing product and you're marketing product or you're, or you're, you're doing marketing at software, yeah, you better have, you know, a, a model, a financial model that's backed up by data to the maximum extent possible. Um, you know, early stage, I think pretty much a huge waste of time. But so I'd say it depends on stage. Yeah, I think we generally don't really see that um, in the form of a big document. I mean, we write those internally, so I guess that might be helpful for me <laughs> yeah, to see some of those. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to read through a 30, 40 page document if I don't know you. Yeah, I don't really see them that often. Um, sometimes when we've gotten through to like third stage due diligence, there might be something in the back of a Dropbox file that we'll look at. But you know, the, th the things we want to look at really when you don't, when you've just got a pitch deck, is we want to see some of your early customers. What you should be preparing for is like those customers prepared for due diligence calls. So we've, we're looking at one pre-seed deal right now. They've got three pilot customers. We're going to want to talk to every single one of those three pilot customers and find out what they think about your company, why they chose you why they're going to retain you later on. So I'd focus more on that kind of stuff. We want to talk to your other investors. We want to talk to your team. There's far more better things you can spend your time on than writing. Yeah, again, a business model can be almost like your like, financial model, right, where it's kind of a wish list. I'm much rather interested in what's happening right now uh, that's generating even a tiny bit of revenue. That's much more compelling for me. Yeah, I usually see um, business plans written more like a more extended deck. Uh, I think it's just easier and easier to read and go through, but should have enough explanation that someone does, you know, someone doesn't have to talk me through it. And again, you know, that's the later stage you are, the more detail you're going to have. And one way you can sort of think about it is almost a series of appendices. You mentioned the appendices, but you know, if you get later, I need to see more about your sales model. How are you? How are you going to sell this? What's pricing look like? Right? There's just so many more. When, once you get past having just a prototype, there's so many more aspects of the business that you have to worry about, whether it's a sourcing strategy or, you know, a, uh, your development pipeline, if you're, you know, in uh, technology, if you're in software, how do all your features stack up to competitors at a much deeper level than you might need to at a very seed stage. So I think as it goes, I would, you know, just keep adding that detail. And as you keep building these appendices, you'll eventually have a pretty complete deck. Okay, last question. So the way that I make a warm introduction is, so I, I have a client who's got an enterprise SaaS software product, and I say, oh, I know this guy, Rob Vickery. He, he does that stuff. He's really good. Um, I would call you first or send you an email, and I would say, Rob, here's a deck or here's a, here's a brief description of, uh, you know, my friend, my client Kevin's company. Would you be interested in seeing that? And you say, yeah, sure. So now I haven't embarrassed you. So now I send an email to you and I say, here's Kevin's deck. Meet Kevin. And I, Kevin, meet Rob. I think you guys should connect. You guys might find uh, your relationship interesting. Kevin doesn't hear from you. How long before Kevin should follow up with you, assuming he got a good introduction, and how many times before he's just being obnoxious? <laughs> you want to go down the line? Okay. Um, so I do appreciate being uh, asked first because then I can tell you, you know, that's really not my thing um, or I know that person and I really don't want to see them again or, uh, you know. Metaphysically uh, speaking. Right. I don't know. I don't know him. <laughs> I don't know him. 
Uh, so, but that does happen sometimes. Um, so it does save a lot of embarrassing moments. Um, I would say generally a week if you don't hear from me to reach out again. And if you don't hear from me after two weeks, you should probably just decide I'm a flake and um, not go. But it's honestly, I know you all think you get a lot of email. I, I have like eight email addresses with all the different companies I work with, and I just can't even keep track of them, and it's such a nightmare. And sometimes it's really embarrassing. I just I say I'm going to get back to somebody, and I don't. And so I guess if I say, hey, I'm going to respond to you in a week, and you don't hear from me, then you could probably um, try a third time. But I think, you know, after twice. The other thing I see people do, I think this is actually kind of nice. So you, you wait a week. Hey, you know, I haven't heard from you. The next time, maybe wait two weeks, right? And then... Um, if it, you know, if it do still doesn't happen, when you have some really big news later on, say, hey, you know, sorry we missed you the first time around, but maybe you want to take a look now. So I think it's just a matter of being polite and realizing that it's not that I'm, y you know, just trying to blow you off. It's just I could be traveling. I mean, I've been in town like three days the last, you know, couple of weeks. I don't know why I keep looking at you. Like, <laughs> right? sorry. sorry, Kevin. Right? So... So I, you know, I think you just, but just not like, hey, I said it to you yesterday, you know, just use some discretion. Yeah. yeah, I mean, try and learn about, try and understand a bit more about how like the VC business works, right? So typically Mondays is when we do a partner meeting and we'll sit down and we go through all of our deal flow. So we'll, uh, we have a database that we keep and we'll go through every single deal and Alex and I will basically say, yes, no, yes, no, we're going to continue on that one, we're going to, you know, park that one. Um, so try and time it around our schedule. Fridays, we always keep Mondays free from pitches, so we just spend all of that time purely on administration, all the crap that we hate doing. Um, and then Fridays are a day that we often like spend a lot of time reflecting and thinking about stuff. So like, give us those five days to, to go through the admin and to go through to the 10,000 feet thinking, and then chase us on the Monday. Um, we have a rule in our firm where if it, takes un if it takes less than five minutes, do it now. So we do try and respond, and we do always tell people that if we don't get back to you in seven days, chase us. Because you know, ultimately for us, it's not good for us if we don't respond to you, because you might not come to us when you create your next company in two years' time, and it's really awesome. So we do try and be like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have missed out. I have, you know, not responded to emails. It is embarrassing. And I see you guys like, in these events, and I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> I met you six months ago, and I never responded. Um, but, yeah, it's not because of, like, we're being arrogant or anything. It's just because we're just like, a bit snowed under. Yeah, Scott, I'd actually like to uh, edit the premise a little bit. So you said, oh, Rob, is this interesting to you? And then make the connection immediately. I would appreciate if you would stay as a buffer and send me the deck so that way I can kind of save face with somebody else. Because, um, I mean, even if you agree to the intro and haven't seen the deck yet, I mean, there's a little bit of risk there, right? So I have a guy, he sends me decks all the time, and um, I always appreciate it. None of them have been a fit, a fit before. But I haven't had to like say no to any entrepreneurs that I, in the, you know, in the in the area. Um, so I always appreciate that. Um, as far as following up, I mean, again, it's all about creating value. So if so if you you know give a hook out to somebody and that's a huge amount of value for what exactly they're doing, they're gonna jump on it. And if your company you know improves or has updates or whatever, I think that's a great way to stay in touch. Be like, hey, we didn't get to. To get to connect last time, but like we just closed this big deal, we just had this great product release. Check it out. I think that's a good way to stay in touch. So going back to your premise, um, I, I solicited the deck in effect, or I solicited the intro because you said take, you should meet this guy, and I trust you or something like that. And I said, okay, Scott, make the intro. Um, you make the intro. Ideally, you actually wait. No, I'm not pointing at you. Ideally, you actually wait. Uh, poor guy. Ideally, you actually wait until I respond before you pile back in. Um, I think it, it shows a little better cadence. You know, give me a day to respond rather than jumping right in and saying, Scott, thanks for the intro. Let's, you know, move you to BCC, whatever. Um, appreciate the aggressiveness, but I think giving giving me a chance to look at it maybe because maybe I didn't look at it maybe I, maybe I just said to Scott if it's if you send it to me it's good enough so send it to me I'll look at it um, give me a day to look at it and then if you and then and then come in and say hey you know I'd like to get together or, you know get on the phone whatever it is 
And yeah, you know, a week, fine. If you don't hear back, you know, you asked for it. I asked for it, right? So, which is different than if I didn't ask for it. Right. If I asked for it, give me a week, come back to me another week. If I don't come back to you again, then I'm pretty much a dick. <laughs> We had a company, our best performing uh, portfolio company, a company based in Santa Barbara. They pitched us. We didn't like their first idea. We turned them down. What the founder kept doing was just doing little quarterly updates, like nice looking email, you know, MailChimp type updates. Here's the, how's the business is going. If you're interested, let's have a chat. We kept like following him, following him. And uh, then he came up with another idea and we just funded it before anybody else. So like it, it does work and that's literally our best performing deal in terms of ARR. We are blown away by him and we're so grateful that he kept like dropping on us like all these little like updates. Um, just one other thing. Um, oh, too late. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, they're doing a Series A in, in September. Um, the other thing that like the one thing like if someone says after an intro like, yeah, I want to chat to you. The worst thing you can do is send me like your Calendly um, availability. <laughs> That's like me going on a date with my, you know, with my wife at the time and saying, so, yeah, here's my availability. Why don't you pick a date that you can come on with me? And I'm just like, fuck off. So it's exactly the same thing with entrepreneurial skills. Like, don't, don't tell me your availability. I'll tell you, perhaps I'll tell you mine, and then we'll find a date. But don't, don't say, I hate Calendly. I wish it would just go away. It's up there with, it's up there with LinkedIn in mail. All right, understanding that you are now standing between drinks and networking, any last final words of wisdom? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I need to go. Uh, That's a thing for me, you go ahead. You do one. So, um, so a, f a few words. So, first off, um, the folks that have presented at the Pre Accelerator, uh, you all actually have a business. Um, and inside of your inside of your company, you might have a business. Um, so important to know that your business is not, you know, um, it's not going to fit for every investor. And different investors have different, you know, different investors fit for different businesses. And so when you know you come and make a pitch to any one of us. You're not competing against the other fintech deal that we're looking at, unless we're a fintech only fund, or you're not looking at the, you're, you're not competing against the IoT deal, you're competing against every other deal that we're looking at, how we deploy capital, second, third, tranches, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I think that the important thing is you guys just keep, keep going, and you, you, know, you only need one investor, really, and that one investor will usually bring enough along that you can uh, get your deal funded. Um, so it's, it's discouraging, you know, calling 100 people and getting 100 no's, but just keep in mind you only need one. Um, the other is that you, you all seem pretty well prepared for an early stage, and I think that's a testament to what you've been doing here uh, at the, at the Pre-Accelerator, so congratulations on that. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I would say just keep your relationships open. Um, like Joe said, you know, sometimes you're, you know, there are other reasons why people will say no. Uh, so, you know, I, we're, we're doing our website and I talked to a bunch of vendors and this guy went down the whole thing with me and then I said no, we decided to go with someone else and really just, you know, simply and elegantly, he's like, thank you, good luck. You know, see you on the next one. And I really appreciated that. It's the same with investment. So um, just keep those relationships open. So you never know in two years when you come back with the next product or, you know, see each other again down the road and the situation has changed, it can all click then. Um, big thing is, like, keep your cap table clean. Like, when we... Um, yeah, lawyers know all about that. Yeah, like, you. you know, when... Listen to this guy. <laughs> we're, We've done more cap table cleanup than I've done in my house in terms of like, you know, why have you got 80 people on there? And why has that celebrity got that much? And why has that person got that much? Like, it's got to make sense. Like, just be really careful when you're building your business and raising your first round. Like, make sure your cap table makes sense. It's logical. Those people on there are adding value. You know, they're not owning too much. If it's an advisor, for example, like we've seen some advisors who are going out there, like offering you, you know, good advice, but they own 10% of your company. That just does not make sense. 
that person has to be factored down to about 0.25% at yeah, best. Yeah, entrepreneurs tend to think that it's easy to give equity because it's free. And in reality, if you believe in yourself, that's the most expensive currency that you have. It's your crown jewels. It's your crown jewels. And when you build a billion dollar business and then that advisor's got 100 million of it, that's going to hurt. And no one else is going to want to invest in it. So clean cap table. And then, like you said, just kiss a lot of frogs. I mean, when we raised our funds, shit, we probably met with gosh, hundreds of LP prospects. Every single one of them like, oh, this and this and this. So, you know, you just have to kiss a lot of frogs and build a thick skin and take advice, learn from it, implement it or get rid of it if you don't like it. Um, and then finally, choose, choose your investors really carefully. Like choose investors who are really good for you. Do your homework on them. Make sure you come to those meetings with questions. Like we had a pitch today from a guy from a very well-known incubator, won't mention their name. He had no questions for us. And we were like, well, so have you even researched us? Do you know what we do? Do you know what we like? You know, come to some questions with us. Push, put, us put us on our pedestal a little bit and like, you know, push back on us. What, what can we do for you? So come with some questions. Uh, I guess just a couple of uh, final random things. One, the corollary to keeping your cap table clean is also keeping all your paperwork clean. Um, I've certainly seen companies that just, and I know that wouldn't happen if you were here, but you can get bad legal advice and you have messy documents and you just have all kinds of weird things and someone just walks in and says like, I, I just, I can't deal with that. So. That, that happens, and um, you know, I, mean, I could tell you some real horror stories about things that I've seen, and it's unfortunate. Um, also, um, you know, this notion that people come back, you, you, know, you may not be right for somebody the first time, but you may take a pivot and something will fall better, or they may see something where you're really a fit, and maybe you know, they wanna connect you. So there's lots of reasons to keep your Keep your relationships clean. Um, and the last thing is, you know, just, um, just be really mindful of what's going on in the market. Things can change very quickly in the funding market. Um, it is, um, you know, I, I've been at, I've been, it's not 25 years actually, but <laughs> um, not even 20, but, uh, you know, we started our fund in 2000. Um, and 2000 was a very interesting time. And within a few years, what you know, VCs were telling companies was completely different. And anybody who couldn't adapt very quickly didn't get funded. I mean, for a while, nobody got funded, let's be fair. But um, you know, I think you just have to be really in tune with what is happening in the marketplace. Be focused on your business. I mean, you can't change the rest of the world, but you know, if people start um, wanting to, uh, people may shift how early they want to invest or the size of investments. I mean, you know, we're seeing these really big seed investments now. I can tell you that never used to happen. You know, a seed investment was like $250,000. You didn't do seed rounds of, you know, millions. So that really um, affects how you write your business plan, how you think about spending cash, and how you think about going out to raise money. This is a pretty frothy, time you know again but it's been like this for a while but it could turn you know it could turn quickly so just pay attention okay we have time for a few questions any questions go ahead Kevin <laughs> no we're not calling you back <laughs> when can I call you <laughs> um, uh, how do you so market size I feel like is always something where it's like I found some study that says my market is worth a bazillion dollars and you know what are some ways like I tried in mind to do like a bottom up for example um, any advice in terms of making it so that the market side is not just complete bullshit and that it's something that conveys some sort of reasonable expectation there uh, I, I think it's um, being really clear about what your addressable market is so it's not you know the world of software or whatever it's this particular thing and, and maybe putting some guideposts in there like i am going after companies of this size and there are this many of those companies uh in the u.s and so if i go after the u.s and if i can sell it for you know and everybody bought one for ten thousand dollars that gives you a bottoms up i mean it doesn't have to be really scientific but just sort of ballpark so that i know is this you know a hundred million dollar opportunity or a you know, 10 billion opportunity. Yeah, like the TAM slide is about as relevant to me as a financial model. It's just like, move on. We know it's big. 
Great. Tell me about how much revenue you're generating from the market. Yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of different things. So, you know, normally we go after very large market, um, very disruptive uh, plays. But we're looking at one right now where, you know, we're, we're sort of just doing the math. And we're, and we're doing the math to say, how big can this business get, full stop? if they get re their share of the market and w what kind of exit does that look like and what kind of valuation are we at? And we looked at one uh, yesterday and, you know, we come to the conclusion that, you know, that's probably an 8x from, w from where they are, which is great if they hit 8x and they don't need any money in between. But so, you know, be real as to who you are and then just find the right investor. Don't try to turn your market into a $3 billion market when it's really a $300 million market because it's not going to work. Yeah, and key question is he said, we're doing the math. So all these guys have analysts. They all have MBA people. When you tell them what your business is going to be like, they're going to reconstruct your business and they're going to know better than you know what, they're, what your business is like. Question there. Uh, we're we're not seeing any of our portfolio companies yet deploying blockchain and blockchain and ICOs and cryptos are three different things. Uh, we are not we're not invested in crypto and uh, we're not playing in the ICO market. Uh, yeah, I've been doing some research on blockchain, but it's still quite early because we want to look at enterprise applications. Um, I keep finding all these cool companies, but then I see, oh, they did an ICO, cross it off the list, basically. So that, that's where we're at now. Yeah, I, I like regulated markets. Regulation's good. Um, I think you need it. <laughs> uh, none of those have any remotely interest for me. I'm an ex-banker, so yeah, I'd just rather invest in VR. <laughs> any other questions? Yes. I think that's an almost impossible question to give one answer to. I mean, it depends what you're doing, right? So if you are um, super early stage, uh, and, and also let me preface that, remember my comment about how market the market changes? Like, it kind of depends on the time, time too. So if you're trying to build uh, an MVP for something, and maybe it takes you depending what you're building. I mean, that could be like three months, that could be 12 months. If you're building something, um, you know, if you're building something that's uh, very, very complex, it, it could take, you know, much longer. So I think you have to, you at least want enough money to, if you're just starting to get through that, get something you can at least put in the market and test and get some feedback to, but I don't know how long that would take. If I, I would hate to run out of money halfway through that. That's a really hard time to raise money when you don't have anything, right? You, and you're kind of past the plan and now you've shown that you kind of weren't smart enough to know how much money you needed to raise. So you don't want to be in that, you don't want to be in that boat. I mean, this is where the financial model is most important. You're, yeah. you're thinking about the wrong metric you're thinking about. You should be thinking about units of time as opposed to units of currency. So you know, how long is it going to take you to build an MVP, to get some sort of, some sort of indication of product market fit? That's the, the equation you should be thinking through. And if that's 5 million or 2 million or 3 million or 10 million, then go with that number. Yeah. That's right. It's, it's time to a milestone. And then plus the error factor, which when you're going to be late. So one more question here.
No. What, what sort of returns would you expect? No, a ADEX is fantastic. If you know you're going to invest $2 million and get $16 million back, that's fantastic. I'll do that all day long. The problem is you don't know that you're going to do that. So, uh, so that, that's where you, you sort of dial back to risk. So if it's a relatively low risk investment, they've already got some product market fit, they've already got customers, they've already got a growth plan, they've shown they can execute, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then it was a little, in this particular case, it was um, a bit of a math exercise to see how much of the market they could realistically get, what that really means from a revenue perspective. They're already generating revenue. So they're sort of uh, early B stage type company. So, you know, and then what does a sale look like for that company? You know, 150 million bucks. So then you can go sort of dial back. Is the valuation reasonable? Are they looking for a $4 million valuation and they don't need very much capital? Well, that, that'd be awesome, but they were looking for more. And so it's, there's no, it, it can also be stage dependent in your fund because you may want to be investing larger or smaller depending on how your portfolio construction is. So, no, we don't turn up our nose at eight. You show me an eight, I'll show you a check. I'll show you a check. I'll show you a check. Yeah. Do you yourself read about how big investors would meet on checks or something that you think about giving you money or something ridiculous? I was at a conference last week for seed funds, and believe it or not, the median top quartile performer is generating 1.9x from a seed. 1.9. Well, yeah, but the the other average is you could read beyond that, um, which was a bank's data, was like 3.4x is what a good fund is performing at. As an angel investor, sadly, when we were writing small checks, we did 11x, but hopefully we'll hit that again with the fund, who knows. But um, yeah, it, it varies. But look, you show me an investment that can generate 1.9 times your money than um, other than venture, then I'm all over it. Yeah, but, yeah. Sorry, but that's a fund return. Fund return, yeah. Yeah, that's different than a company return. So oh, you if you're do. an angel investor, you need a company to that has much higher potential because a lot of them are going to fail. So yeah, 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 yeah. So in a general portfolio, you kind of have your like singles, doubles, triples, and home runs. We're not intentionally building a portfolio to like include a single. You know, <laughs> Every, yeah, we're not like okay, that one's going to be a single. That's fine. Every one, we're trying to hit a home you're run. You're not batting for the cycle? Power, no, no. Because it's power law. Like a few of the investments will carry the returns for the whole fund. And so when we're thinking about businesses, we're like, can this be a huge business? Uh, otherwise, we don't, we'll pass. Yeah, there, there, there is this on, you know, to your point on market prices and affordability and all those other things, where you could make that estimate or the talk to somebody else who's based on, oh my God, this is such a steep job. Uh, it's probably based on, on the real world factors. You have to remember, venture is a 10-year asset class. This is not a. This is a long-term lockup. You don't get your money back once you invest in, and you're in there. So you know that those period of, of time for those returns can be anywhere from as short as you know three years for an early exit up to 10 all the way through, even 12 because you have potentially one-year uh, extensions on your fund too. So it's very hard to say, but it's a long-term asset class and. You should be willing to wait if you want to get into it. All right. Thanks to the panel.